Welcome to Eat, Sleep, Wine, Repeat, a podcast for all you wine lovers who, if you're like me, just cannot get enough of the good stuff. I'm Yanina Doyle, your host, brand ambassador, wine educator, and sommelier. So stick with me as we dive deeper into this ever-evolving, wonderful world of wine. And wherever you are listening to this, cheers to you. Hello, wine friends, and welcome back to another episode. And if you didn't already know, you have tuned in to one of my deep dive episodes specifically put together to help my WSET diploma friends pass their wine exams or for all of you who feel like getting really geeky on, well, in this episode, sparkling wine, specifically champagne. And this is part two of the Sparkling Wine Deep Dive series. So if you haven't listened to part one, go back to episode 129, where I am going through the production methods of all the sparkling wines of the world. But today, we're going to focus on the delimited region champagne, which can be found around 90 miles northeast of Paris. So as we all know, this is the symbol for luxury and celebration and the place with worldwide recognition as the most premium place for traditional method sparkling wine. So this is going to need its own episode. So as always, this is going to be set up like flashcards. So you can pause the audio and have a think, but of course I'm only pausing for a second or two. So should you just want to play all the way through and listen, it's perfect that way too. Don't forget, you can download the transcript, just go to my show notes and it's right at the top, or you can visit my website, www.eatsleepwinerepeat.co.uk slash podcasts. So pour yourself a glass of champagne if you have a bottle, especially if you're listening on the day of release, because champagne on a Monday should be a legal requirement, no? (laughs) So sit back and enjoy. So we can't talk about champagne without talking about terroir. So that's where we're going to start. So my question to you is, What is the climate for the Champagne region and what are the weather hazards you can find here? Well, as this region sits on the 49th parallel in the north of France, it has a cool continental climate and it has an average annual temperature of 11 degrees Celsius and a very low average hours of sunshine. We are talking 1,680 per day year. Now, I just want to give you some crazy context just to make us all feel bad uh, if we're living in England or close nearby. Down on the southern coast of France, Provence averages 2,700 to 3,000 hours per year. Right. Anyway, on to the hazards. In Champagne, we're looking at frosts and winter freeze being the most potentially serious. Now, after the cool climate, another major factor that affects the flavour of champagne is the soils. So what type do you find in the champagne region? The answer is chalk and limestone. They are the soils most commonly talked about. They are highly porous and they can store enough water to protect the vines through dry summers. There is also marl and sand in other important areas, for instance, in the Valley de la Man. Now, when we talk about grape varieties, there are seven that are permitted, although most plantings are the famous three. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. But what are the other four? So you have Arban, Petit Meslier, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris, although together they represent less than about 1% of the plantings in Champagne. Now, how many Grand Crus and Premier Crus are there in Champagne? So for the Grand Crus, there are 17 villages. And for the Premier Crews, there are 44 villages. So there are 14 sub-regions in Champagne, but there are the important five. So what are they? The five are Montagne de Reims. And when I say Reims, it's spelt R. 
E I M S. Remember, there's the transcript because I am now going to go through a lot of French <laughs> villages. We have Valley de la Marne, which I mentioned, the Côte de Blanc, Côte de Sassan, and Côte de Bar. So, if we are looking at the Montagne de Rennes, what is the dominant grape variety and where can you find it? So, it's famous for Pinot Noir with more than 40% of the plantings. And you can find this subregion between Epinay and Rennes. So, these are the two major places to visit in Champagne. This is the region also with the most Grand Crus. So, what are they? There are nine of them. Are you ready? <laughs> so, from north, curving around and then going down to the south, we have Puissieux, Silare, Maï Champagne, Versenay, Verzi, Beaumont Sauvel, Ambonnet, Bouzy, and Louvois. So don't forget, go to the transcript so you can see the spellings. Now, just south of the Montagne de Rennes is the Vallée de la Manne, and they have two Grand Crus here, which are effectively an extension of the Montagne de Rennes. So, what are these? They are I and Tor Suman. But as you go further west into this region, the fruit here is considered to be lower in quality, whereas in these two Grand Crus, Pinot Noir is the most important. As a whole, what is the grape variety that dominates this region? The answer would be Pinot Meunier, and this can produce easier drinking fruity wine. Pinot Meunier has never been considered the premium star grape variety. It's always going to be Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Champagne region. So continuing south, we have the Côte de Blanc. What is the famous grape variety growing here? Well, it is Chardonnay. This is the region for Blanc de Blanc, which translates to white of white. So a white wine made from white grapes, as opposed to Blanc de Noir, which is white of black, meaning a white wine made from black skinned grapes. So Pinot Noir and Meunier. So back to the Grand Cru's, there are six here in the Côte de Blanc. What are they? So we have Chouillet, Cramont, Waré, Avis, Roger, Le Manil se Roger. Now that is all the 17 Grand Crus mentioned, but we still have two important subregions to touch on. So let's go to the Côte de Cézanne which is just southwest of the Côte de Blanc. So this is basically a continuation of the Côte de Blanc with similar chalky soils. I am sure you can imagine the grape. Yes, it is Chardonnay, but typically this region is known to have less finesse with no Premier Cruz either. Now, finally, we get to the Côte de Bar. Where do you find this region? So the Côte de Bar is actually very separate from the rest of the Champagne regions, and it's located in the most southernmost part of the Champagne region, which gives it a slightly warmer and a more continental climate compared to the rest of Champagne. Because of this, what grape reigns here? It is very much about Pinot Noir. And on a side note here, the Côte de Bar actually has seen a real rise in the production of grower champagnes, which are champagnes produced by the same estate that owns the vineyards, in contrast to the larger champagne houses that very often are buying their grapes from various sources. Now, I wanted to touch on the price of grapes and a little bit of champagne business for a second. So the price of grapes, which then ended up creating the Grand Cru's and the Premier Cru's, were in fact established by what system that has now been abandoned? L'échelle des Cru's, which would translate to graded ladder of growths. So this is basically a system used in the Champagne region from 1919 
And it was to classify vineyards according to their quality. There was far too many issues going on beforehand. So what it did, it focused on the vineyards and they would give a 100 point scale, which was used to determine the price of grapes at harvest. Now, of course, this led to confirming which villages were the best based on those vineyards that were getting the best points. And therefore, certain villages received the title Grand Cru or below that Premier Cru. So to understand this system, under the L'Echelle de Cru, vineyards were ranked from 80 to 100 points based on a combination of factors such as soil type, their exposure, the altitude, and its historical reputation. So the highest ranked vineyards, they were designated as 100%. And grapes from these vineyards, they would command the highest prices at harvest. Then you had the vineyards that were ranked below 80 points and they weren't even considered suitable for producing grapes at all for champagne production. However, when the system started, they did in fact rank vineyards from 22.55%. So there was an evolution. Now, most villages would be ranked between 80 to 89%. Premier crews would be 90 to 99 percent and then the Grand crews were from villages with a hundred percent. However, with the European Union's fundamental principles of open and free markets, the central price fixing with the Echelle de Cru system, it was abandoned in 1990 but the scale itself did stay until 2004 when it was fully abandoned. This system, however, it might not exist now, but really acts still as a guide to help out with the pricing that's been left now to be a discussion between the growers and the champagne houses. So the price of grapes is just influenced by a variety of factors now. So there'll be the element of supply and demand, the quality of the harvest and the prevailing market conditions. It's also worth pointing out that Grand Cru and Premier Cru now doesn't actually have any official value. And in theory, with their history, they should resemble better quality, but that may not actually be the case. And so when looking for the very best, it is actually better to look out for specific, well-known producers of quality. So you'll be happy to know we have done the, the terroir, the grapes, the regions, but staying out in the vineyard for a little bit longer, there are in fact four approved different pruning methods in Champagne that you should know about. These have been approved since 1938, so what are they? So you have Taille Chablis, Cordon de Roya, Gaillot, so this is single and double, and Valle de la Man. So as not to make you all fall asleep, I will let you look these methods up online where you can actually watch some videos or see some pictures to make it easier for you. But if we now go into the winery, there are other rules and regulations that must be followed. And one of these would be the yield when pressing. Now, I did mention the yields that champagne producers have to adhere to back in my first deep dive episode on sparkling wine. But let's test you again, see if you were listening. <laughs> so if you load 4,000 kilograms of grapes into a press, how much juice can you draw off? So you can only draw off 20.5 hectolitres of the cuvee or the first pressing as it's known. And then the taille which is the subsequent press fraction, can only be five hectolitres. So that's a total of 25.5 hectolitres. And when it comes to ageing, what are the minimum ageing terms for a non-vintage champagne? And this is in total and the time on the lees. Well, in total, it has to be 15 months before release and 12 months of that time must be on the lees. And what about the minimum aging times for vintage champagne? Again, in total, and then how much on the lees? So it is 36 months in total, with 12 months having to be on the lees. Now, 
When it comes to the management of production quotas, this is done by the CIVC, which is an organisation primarily in place to safeguard the champagne name. They represent the interests of the champagne wine producers and the growers. They're there to regulate, promote the champagne industry, to conduct research and to market the wines effectively. So my question is, what does CIVC stand for? So it stands for Comité Interprofessionnel de Vin de Champagne. And on every bottle of champagne, you should be able to find two letters which represent who made the wine. So you're going to be wanting to look out for the letters N, M, R, M, S, R, C, M, RC, ND, and then MA. Now, if you want to have a think about what they all are, have a pause now, but I'm going to go ahead and go through each one. So, NM stands for Negociant Manipulant, and this is a champagne house. If you see RM, that stands for Recoltant Manipulant, and this is a grower who produces wine from his own grapes. If you see SR, that's Societe de Recoltant. It's two or more growers who share the same winery to produce and market wines from their grapes. If you see CM, this is Cooperative Manipulant, and it is a cooperative wine. If you see RC, this is Recoltant Cooperative. It's a grower who sells wine made from his grapes, but that are made by the cooperative. If you see ND, that's Negociant Distributeur. It's a broker who buys and sells finished wine. And finally, if you see MA, that's Marc Dacheteur. It's a brand owned by a retailer or a restaurant. Now, you could be unlucky in your wine exams and get a producer question. Ugh, they were always my absolute worst nightmare. Now, it's bad enough to know the rules, the terroir, the geography and the methods, but also to know about the wineries too. It gives me a headache thinking about it. Well, I want to quickly just touch on prestige cuvee champagnes. And then we can look at a few producers that may hopefully help. So what is Prestige Cuvée Champagnes? Well, Prestige Cuvée Champagnes, they are high-end champagne wines. They're considered the pinnacle of the Champagne region's production. These wines, they're going to be made from the best grapes. They're going to be aged for longer than the other champagnes. And of course, for that reason, you're going to get more complex and more refined flavours. Now, Prestige Cuvée champagnes, they are produced by the most renowned, the most prestigious champagne houses, such as Dom Perignon, Krug, Louis Roderer, and of course, many others. So these champagnes, they're often released only in the most exceptional vintages and they are in limited quantities and it makes them, of course, very highly sought after by wine collectors. Now, there are loads of producers that you should know about and disclaimer, I did do my diploma about eight years ago. So I'm going to touch on a few as I'm not sure if there is a specific list for you guys to look at. But for now, Here is some information on Don Perignon. So Don Perignon is a prestige champagne brand. It's owned by the champagne house Moet and Chandon. And by the way, Moet, you do pronounce the T at the end. Don Perignon was named after a French Benedictine monk. He was credited with developing the champagne making process in the early 18th century. Dom Perignon produces only vintage champagnes, which means that all the grapes they used in the blend are harvested from a single year. Dom Perignon is made primarily from the two grape varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And after the initial fermentation and blending, Dom Perignon is aged in the bottle for a minimum of seven years, which is longer than most other champagnes. 
So Dom Perignon produces a series of prestige cuvées, which are some of the most highly regarded and expensive of the champagne offerings. So the production of Dom Perignon is limited in theory. Sorry, I'm letting my own thoughts guide me and you, I guess, rather than their story. <clears throat> so only a small number of bottles are released each year. Again, just my thought, I think this is probably one of the most highly produced prestige cuvées out there. According to Moet and Chandon, the annual production of Dom Perignon typically ranges from 5,000 to 6,000 cases. That's 30,000 to 36,000 bottles per year. And of course, this is one of the most expensive champagnes on the market with prices ranging from several hundred to several thousand pounds per bottle. Now, let's go to Krug, which for your information, is one of my personal favourites. Krug is a prestige champagne house. They're based in Rennes and they certainly have some of the most expensive and sought after champagnes in the world. Krug was founded in 1843 by Johann Joseph Krug. So he was a German immigrant who settled in France and thankfully for us began producing champagne. They are of course very much only about the finest quality. So Krug uses this very complex and very meticulous blending process. They're well known for it and that's how they create their champagnes. So this can involve hundreds of different wines from different vineyards and different vintages. They do produce both non-vintage and vintage champagnes and the vintage champagnes they are of course among some of the most highly regarded and expensive out there. Krug, their champagnes are aged for an extended period of time with some vintages being aged for up to 20 years before release. Now, they are known for aging their wines in barrels and for this reason, along with the reserve stock and the time aging, Krug champagnes are known for their rich and really complex flavours. And like DP, Dom Perignon, it's all about limited quality and they sell, of course, for several hundred to several thousand pounds per bottle. So, are you ready for Cristal? Now, Cristal is all about luxury, opulence, and of course, like the others, it's limited and it is expensive. So, Cristal was created in 1876 by the champagne house Louis Roderer, and this is the special cuvee that was for Tsar Alexander II of Russia. So, Cristal is made primarily from the two great varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Cristal is aged in bottle for a minimum of six years before release and Cristal is known for its distinctive packaging. So that is the clear bottle with a very flat bottom and of course has quite a distinctive label. Now, slightly less luxury, but it's important that we talk about the Grand Marks too. So what is a Grand Mark? So a Grand Mark Champagne is a champagne that is produced by one of the most prestigious champagne houses in the Champagne region. The term Grand Marc is used to refer to a top champagne house. So it's known for its high quality, its long-standing reputation for excellence. And then to be considered a Grand Marc champagne, this champagne house has to meet certain criteria, such as using only the best grapes from the best vineyards. It needs to employ strict quality control measures throughout the production process and age in their champagne for a certain amount of time to intensify that flavor that they are so well known for. So examples of a Grand Marc champagne house would include Moet and Chandon, it would include Verve Clicquot, Bollinger, Dom Perignon, of course, Krug, Louis Roderer. So of the above list, I am going to finish off with a little more information about those that I haven't touched on. So Moet and Chandon, they were founded in 1743. Moet and Chandon actually is the largest champagne house in the world and produces, well, that's not really that much of a surprise, is it? <laughs> they produce some of the most well-known and widely consumed champagnes, including, of course, the Moet and Chandon Imperial and, as we've already talked about, Don Perignon. So Moet and Chandon, they in fact own over a thousand hectares of vineyards in the Champagne region themselves, which makes them the largest vineyard owner in the region. Now, Verve Clicquot. 
I like talking about Verve Clico because of the woman behind it, which I'll touch on in a second. So they were founded in 1772. Uh, Verve Clico, they're definitely known for the signature orangey yellow label. They're also very much considered to be the pioneers in the development of modern champagne making techniques. So they produce Verve Clico Brut Yellow Label, Verve Clico Rosé, and the Verve Clico Le Grand Dame. And here we go. So when talking about Le Grand Dame, we have to give credit to... Madame Clicquot and she developed the technique of riddling which as you should all know from the previous sparkling wine podcast involves turning and gradually tilting the bottles to encourage that sediment to collect in the neck of the bottle so it can easily be removed she did that Madame Clicquot is also credited with developing the first vintage champagne in 1810 and under her leadership and of course keep in mind this is a time when ladies didn't really get to make those kind of decisions, the Clico brand expanded its reach and popularity beyond the French aristocracy and into new markets, including Russia and the United States. So always they'll get a big stamp of approval from me. Uh, What do we have now? Louis Rodera, founded in 1776. Louis Rodera is a family-owned champagne house that produces several different labels, of course, and one of them is Cristal. Uh, They have remained family-owned and independent for over two centuries, with the same family running the company since its beginnings. And I'm going to just finish you off with a quick look at Bollinger. I do love a delicious bottle of Bolly. They were founded in 1829 and have been family owned for five generations. Bollinger is known for producing rich and full bodied champagnes, including the Bollinger Special Cuvée and Le Grand Arni and the Bollinger RD. Bollinger owns over 175 hectares of vineyards in the Champagne region, which are primarily located in the I, Versailles, and Versailles areas. And for a fun fact, to finish, yes, that's right, to finish this podcast, Bollinger has a long association with the James Bond film franchise with its champagnes appearing in numerous films over the years. So that is it for today. I hope these episodes are really helping you. And if so, do share with someone else who's studying or another wine-loving friend who wants to get serious. There will also be a part three in a few weeks to look at the other wine regions of the world producing sparkling. So watch out for that. But for now, may I finish with a wine quote as always, and I'm sure you all know this very famous one. This one is from Mark Twain. And he said, Too much of anything is bad but too much champagne is just right. Uh, I'm not going to say I agree as I, I can't condone excess drinking, but who can say no to a glass of champagne? So I want to tell you about next week. I am finally going to start releasing my little mini series on South Africa. I went in January this year and I just fell in love. I visited some amazing wineries and so I'm going to be talking with them all over the coming weeks. Everyone, if you have thought about going to South Africa, put it on the top of your list. So next week I'm going to be talking with RJ Botha. So he is the cellar master at Kleiner Zalsi in Stellenbosch. This place is an amazing destination to stay, to drink wine, to eat, to play golf. We will, however, be talking about Chenin Blanc on this episode, so do get ready. Now, please don't forget to leave a review or a rating on your podcast app if you are enjoying these episodes. And for now, may the only pain you feel this week be champagne. Yeah, I know. I am. I'm brilliant. I am. Oh, dear. So until next week, my friends, cheers to you.